Welcome to Grow My Business or Sell It, the podcast that helps entrepreneurs in three ways. How to grow your business in the most cost-effective way, how to sell it for as much money as possible, and how to invest the proceeds of all that hard work. Whichever stage you're at, Listen up, because I guarantee you'll take something valuable from every episode. Welcome back. My guest today continues the international flavor of entrepreneurs that we've spoken to on Grow My Business or Sell It, because he comes from the Czech Republic. He had a promising career as a professional basketball player that was cut short by health issues, and he then channeled his energies into business and grew one of the largest packaging materials companies in the country before selling it to packaging giant Bunzel. Since then, he's invested in businesses in the hospitality sector and in sport, as well as growing his private portfolio. His name is Philip Linek. Philip, welcome to the show. Hi, Graham. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, well, let's start by, you know, perhaps you could just tell me a bit about your, your early life growing up in what was originally communist Czechoslovakia and later became the Czech Republic in 1993. What, what were those times like? Well, it's, uh, I think it was hard times for, for all Czechs, uh, most of them actually. I was born in 1977. It was strong communism uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, we were poor family. We were four kids, two parents, small flats, having just four, you know, energy, some food, clothes, and it, it, it was tough. And, uh, you know, funny story is that we have to only two pants, so just two can go out, two has to stay at home. Uh, probably it's not true, but, but uh, nice story. But the truth is we didn't have money for, you know, school, canteen. Most of the people have the just nothing, maybe one cottage, some car. We didn't have a car, uh, and uh, you know it was it was uh, strange. And uh, when everything changed in 1989, it was a big change for most of the people, and they can take their chance. Uh, till that, you couldn't do nothing. You know, my parents uh, wasn't joining the communist party, so we didn't have chance to you know studying to uh, do your own business. It's probably uh, very strange to uh, normal democratic life. Yeah. So, 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 what, uh, what was the kind of, you know, what was the work that your parents did, and what was your education like? Oh, uh, actually, I, I, you know, just uh, joined elementary school, then sport gymnasium because, as you mentioned, I play basketball on professional level uh, till eighteens, and my father was working for the fi- film company. Uh, I, I don't know what was his salary, but maybe it was at 50 euros per month, something like that. My mother was at home. Uh, she's taking care of about four kids. Uh, she couldn't study because of, you know, communist party because my grandpa was strictly against and was close to uh, President Benesh. So yeah, it was uh, it was it was tough life. However, I, I, I quite enjoy my childhood because uh, I sport. Uh, just close my, you know, flat every day, out of home. So lots of friends. It wasn't bad. Okay, so so you got this this kind of first career as a professional athlete playing basketball. I mean, you know, for for having described that, that you know the challenges of living in a communist country. Um, how, how do you go about becoming a professional basketball player? Oh, actually, I, I was quite small. Or well, I'm small. I'm 181 centimeters. And probably I wouldn't never play NBA, but it was my dream. Uh, so, yeah, I, I played quite well on Czech level, but uh, suppose it would be a very hard uh, goal uh, to reach the NBA player. Uh, but just it was just only chance to be, uh, you know, to be famous, to be rich, to be a good uh, sports player. So I, I chose this. And uh, I, I played for my 10. I played, I was twice the champion of Czech Republic in 16 and, and 17 years old. And I also attended sport gymnasium. So I, I had a two, three times training a day. And I was starting to earn money also from my 15, just, you know, small money for basketball. And I was starting to, uh, you know, cleaning houses for Americans when, you know, uh, 89, everything changed. So a lot of foreigners came to Prague. So I cleaning them houses, cutting their grasses. So uh, I attending gymnasium, play basketball, and earning 1,000, 1,500 euros per month. So uh, that time was quite nice. 
that would be a good income at that time. Absolutely, yes. But unfortunately, I think some, some health issues came along that brought a, a premature end to your sporting career. Yeah, that's right. You know, when I was 18, just before the graduation in gymnasium, I had some, you know, quite serious health uh, complications. And at the end, they uh, diagnostic me the Crohn disease. So next two years, I passed the quite serious two surgeries, uh, which one was, uh, you know, uh, uh, colon uh, resection. And then I had, a, you know, one year stoma, etc. But finally, basketball has to finish. So I, I finished for a day. And I, I had a signed contract in Germany for my 18, and uh, that, that, that was like that. So I had to find another motivation to, to live, to be honest. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. No, that must have been a huge, huge blow, especially at such an early age. And, you know, I, 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 I suppose ultimately it became very character building for you and, and gave you some of the drive and motivation that would then come out in your business career. But when it first happened, you know, what did you actually do? How did you find a, a new form of income after basketball? Well, I, I have to go work. I, I'd like to study university, but, you know, I couldn't be, you know, support by, you know, financial support from my family. So I had to go work. So first it was quite frustrating for me. I started in travel agency doing some, you know, selling the tickets in London, whatever. <laughs> it was a three months experience. And then I found... Uh, job uh, as a sales representative in, in wholesale packaging company and they had new product which was bags with printing and they told me hey you will be saying selling the bags with printing it's our new product and uh, your base salary will be 400 euros something like that and you will get 10 percent from your from your profit you bring so i just switched the sport the, the, the will the fair game uh, the playing with the team, whatever, and starting just selling bags, and it worked. So in half a year, I st uh, I earned uh, one hundred thousand euros to the company, and and go for that ten percent, which is ten thousand euros, quite good money. They didn't pay me; <laughs> they just told me it's too much. They couldn't pay me such a salary, so I quit. And that was the start of a scar blast because there was negative motivation to to do my own business. So, 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 it had you a verbal agreement rather than a written contract with these? Oh, guys? it was only verbal agreement. Uh, you know, just you know, Czech Republic uh, in nineteen was very, you know, uh, simple, simple years. So they owe me till now. So, so they owe me till now. Wow. Okay, but I guess the good news was that you've proven what a great salesman you were. So that you know, and, and if there's one skill I would argue that you need if you set your own business up is to be a great salesman. So, 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 how did you you know take what you'd learned? You obviously again you had first the disappointment of your your basketball career ending, then the disappointment of somebody reneging on their promise to pay you 10,000 euros. So what happens now? You decide, right, that's it. I'll show you. I'll, I'll set my own company up. Yeah, just just like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to be bigger than them, which which happened three years, three years after. And uh, to be honest, it, it was, you know, clearly negative motivation just, you know, to be angry and upset. It didn't pay me. But uh, in one, two years, I, I found it's quite nice fun and uh, it makes me happy. And, you know, I start with nothing. I just borrowed 10,000 euros to buy the first initial, you know, to pay initial payment for car, have the first stock purchase, uh, buy a computer and, and rent a small, you know, tiny office and first warehouse where it was 120 boxes. And I was just delivering the boxes to the butchers, to the grocers, green grocers, delivering seven days a week. 14 hours a day, and that was my start. And but by the time I had first employee in six months, and it started to be serious business. Okay, so so you were selling packaging materials um, to, uh, I guess you had to go out and find a new customer base, or were these people you'd already met in the previous job selling the bags? Well, actually, you know, uh, I started quite late. 1997 is late in Czech Republic. The, the best money was earned between 1990 to 1994. So in 1997, the, the market was quite established. So it was it was hard to, you know, you, you have to do something more. And what I did, I was just cheap. Uh, you know, my margin were low. I started buying the wholesalers for from importers, few boxes that more and more. The key reason why I was maybe successful was all profits I'll just put on stock and put on, you know, gross. 
I, I didn't spend any 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 crown. I, I just tried to grow. It. And uh, yeah, wasn't easy. Would be much more easy earlier, but it just worked. If you are flexible, I I, I could supply better. You know, Sunday evening doesn't matter. Uh, I will supply for a fair price, for a cheap price. It was it's it was huge. All the time was low cost business. Our margins was between fourteen to eighteen percent. Bit margin between five to eight percent max, and it was huge volumes, but low margin business. And uh, yeah, it, it was hard hard work. Seven days a week, twenty four hours a day. And so, so just talk me through that kind of growth path. You got your first small office and warehouse. Then six months later, your first team member. Um, as you went into the second year and the third year of the business, you know, how, how did you manage that growth? Because you're you're kind of out there doing the work, selling all of these boxes and packaging material, and trying to run a business at the same time. We've all been there. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not. It's not. I, I have to learn a lot, of course. You know, I, I couldn't attend. I couldn't join uh, the study in university, so I, I learned by practice. So first, I was selling. The second, I have to you know managing my employees. In 30, I already have five, six employees. There was drivers, there was, you know, sales representative, there was some assistant, accountant, whatever. So, uh, yeah, well, it was, you know, all the time changes, but every year our growth was, you know, double, triple at the beginning was, was amazing. Uh, we just did what our customer needs and they need to be flexible. Whenever they need, they had the goods. So it was maybe okay. easier than it looks. Uh, well, I'm sure it wasn't, especially putting all those hours in. But I guess gradually, as you built the team up, you you could focus more on on what winning bigger contracts and and, and yes. the more transformational deals. Yes, the, the the biggest growth was with the retail chains, of course. So we, we start to supply first retail chain, I think, two thousand three, two thousand four, and then we already, you know, in two thousand eight, we start to supply the Kaufland, all European countries. We start to supply the little. And, and, and lots of others. We, you know, there are still some uh, retail chains in Czech you couldn't supply if you if you didn't pay the, the purchasing uh, department or purchasing manager, which was crazy. So I lost lots of uh, tenders because I never paid someone who's buying uh, badly to have room for be paid. So, but, but it was a big advantage when I was selling the business because it was first condition for Bunzo. They would never buy the company. They, you know, uh, part of the bribes, which is which was very common in Czech in nineteens and even early uh, two thousand. And, and I guess very much a throwback to the communist era when that was very much the norm. Yeah, yeah, it was normal. Yeah, it was normal. Yeah, and, and and I think you know we we still see evidence of that today with with Russia and some of the things where they have. Problems with some of their military equipment, where the <laughs> the people who were buying it were more concerned about the uh, the bung they were getting than the quality of the goods. But um, so so you're building this business up. Um, at what point did you think that obviously you've done organic growth, one customer at a time? At what point did you start thinking, well, maybe I could actually buy some other companies, buy my competitors, and grow my business through acquisitions? It started 2010 to thinking it's going to be much more easy to buy a competitor to, to grow because you, you can't ever stop. Whenever you stop, you'll probably die or it's a big chance to die. So we'd like to grow not only organically, which was working. Uh, and, you know, in, after 2008, 2009, our sales were uh, between 12 to 16 million uh, euros, which is not small business. However, you know, the final decision of, a, of, of one acquisition was Eurobal, which uh, used to be in 2008 company bought by Bunzel. So I'd like to buy a company which had a, you know, a little bit struggling in, on Czech market, uh, you know, sales decreasing, there are some troubles, but they still have a quite ma nice market share, not only in Czech. So I, I, I met twice or three times some guys from Bunzel C and discussing, um, interested in buying Eurobow and at the end we we'll just turn up uh, on the different side and they just came if you know with what to do with Eurobow we will buy you and I told no it's it's no chance it's my child I never saw my child uh, after seven, 17 years and they just came twice and the last offer was uh, was accepted by me couldn't be refused it was a very good offer 
So this is so uh, an amazing story. So you go out to buy effectively Bunzel's check division. Yes. And the head office presumably starts sniffing around. And then they say, actually, why don't we buy this guy's business? Which, you know, talk about turning the tables is a fantastic story, isn't it? It is, and it makes sense. You know, it helped them quite a lot, and and I find it emerged. You know, Euroball and Oscar Plus to one company to bump the check. We made a very nice deal with Tesco consolidation. Uh, it was an amazing project with four thousand uh, SKUs items, one hundred and fifty uh, two hundred suppliers, four countries. So th- there were lots of uh, you know advantage of of uh, uh, this merge by these two companies. So it makes sense for Bunzel also, but I wasn't prepared to sell to be honest, and it wasn't easy even after all the uh, due diligence and and all the SPAs, contract revision, or whatever. So just few minutes before we should sign, I, I was prepared to leave, and my lawyer had to just stop me and you will sell. <laughs> And I did, which was okay, of course, which was correct and and right thing, definitely. Well, it's a it's such a big decision, and I guess put you in a really strong negotiating position because they've approached you. You're not in a genuinely not in a mindset to sell, and so you, I guess, you could just keep sitting there saying no while the offers got bigger and bigger. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, it, it was a beginning. Whenever we started talking, then it was you know tough negotiation about the price. So uh, yeah, I, I found Bunzel will never never sell a business. Bunzel was an amazing company, buying 20, 25 companies per year between two thousand ten, two thousand sixteen, seventeen. You know, high acquisitions company, uh, mostly relying on the owners like me. They were leading quite, uh, you know, they had a freedom in, in their region and it was business focused company in every region, difference, no corporation. It, it started to be changing in 2017, but, but by that, that time, uh, it was, uh, you know, a strong company with very good, uh, you know, negotiators with me. And th- then we discussed the price and conditions and everything and, and completions. And it, it was, it was very, you know, I would tell, Tough year, uh, all due diligence, and you have to completely clean your your house, your, your company prepared for acquisition. It's, it's it's not easy. It's a big story. A uh, huge distraction, but I'm just fascinated about you know. I'd love to have been a fly on the wall when you're having this talk with your lawyer, and you have the the pen is in your hand, it's poised, and you're thinking, do I want to sign this or not? I mean, has there ever been a moment when you thought, ah, I wish I hadn't done that? Uh, no, no. Whenever you sign, you just, you know, find your figures on your account and, uh, you know, you just, you make, can make a relax. You know, I, I, I didn't even, uh, you know, notice that I'm, I'm quite tired after 17 years and it, it was a nice change. Uh, and, you know, the three and a half year I worked for Bunzel it was a great experience with lots of I learned. I, I helped them buy another company in Czech and I helped them with merch and, help with the Tesco consolidation I already mentioned and it was a different story but it was it was a completely different job and I can relax more and rely on their financial you know uh, skills well this is interesting though because you know for many entrepreneurs um, one of the most kind of strange and almost dangerous times is that moment when they've just sold the business the money's in the bank and it's like what do you do next? But in your case, and, and it's not unusual to have some kind of earnout agreement, but it sounds like they actually gave you quite a, a senior role with quite a bit of freedom and, and that you actually did that for two or three years when, you know, the, the thought for many people of a, of a three year earnout would be so painful, you know, such a change from being an entrepreneur to an employee. So it was quite a culture shock out of thought to now find yourself working for this big multinational corporation. Yes, you, you are of course right. But it, it seemed to me Bunzel was quite different. Uh, when I sold my business, there were maybe 35, 40 employees, previous owners, still working for Bunzel. And, and I, th- I, I think Frank Tinton, which is now CEO, uh, used to be owner of some company in Netherlands, similar slides like Oscar Blast in the past. So there are still some owners working for Bunzel. And uh, as I mentioned, 2000. 12, 2016, Bunzel was a fully focused uh, on the business uh, regionally, 
uh, no corporation rely on the owners which uh, who, who knows their business and how to you know just make a big margin which was the most important things for shareholders so it worked it worked it, it wasn't too bad you know 2017 was a big change and seems to me start to be cooperation and it, it start to be hard for me uh, more and more harder and uh, then I quit in I think 2018 August so, so, so tell me about some of the things that you did during that kind of three-year period with Bunzel post-selling the business. What sort of projects did they get you involved in? Uh, you mean in Bunzel or out of the Bunzel? Yeah, in, 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 whilst you were still with Bunzel. Oh, actually, you know, the, the, the key was Tesco Consolidation. It was a huge project and it, it take me maybe 50, 60 you know, percent of my time. Uh, you know, if you can just imagine there are four countries or five countries supplied by 200 suppliers and one day will come Philip Linek to the office and tell them hey only Bunzel will supply you because we make a deal in London so you know it was it was crazy for all uh, instead uh, 100 cards uh, every week comes only one Bunzel car with 4000 SKUs so you have to you know uh, take over all the suppliers and then you have to source your own resource in Far East to, to switch the items, negotiate the price, new price, cross dock, to, to bring the savings for Tesco, bring the, bring the profit for Bunzel. So it was, it was a huge project. This one was you know, the, the, the most difficult for me and I learned a lot by this. And of course, the match wasn't easy. Oscar passed in Euroball uh, to check Bunzel. And I also spent some time by buying, uh, you know, safety company, the protective uh, equipment uh, here in Czech. So, yeah, it was a nice experience. Okay. So, so then eventually you get to a point where you decide, no, I, I want to be out of Bunzel. Um, did you just take some complete time off and downtime or did you, did you find yourself getting bored very quickly and looking for another project? Oh, actually, you know, I'm not able to work for cooperation. You know, every year was hard for me, the budgeting, strategic planning, all the you know, explanation for shareholders, whatever. I'm a business-focused guy. So whenever it's starting to be on me, then I was starting to be a bit bored. So I was thinking quite a long time. Moreover, I, you know, I had a relapse with my Crohn disease. So there was two things together which caused that uh, I, I will leave and, and focus on myself a few months, which was which was also nice. I played six months golf. I didn't survive longer, but uh, it was also a good experience not to do nothing. Okay, so so you've had six months on the golf course. Presumably you're, you've turned a corner with your health. Um, and then I guess you start to look at other business opportunities that might be uh, uh, interesting projects for you. Yeah, actually, you know, you, you start to look around whenever you sell the business because you have some figure on your account. So first things is, I don't want to lose the money. So you, you will, you know, put in different accounts, different banks, and then you think what you're going to do because uh, inflation could come, whatever. And uh, we, we are, you know, witnesses of today's inflation, which is crazy. So I start investment uh, already in 2014. Actually, I've already invested in 2007 and bought some sports uh, center, well, uh, you know, in the center of Prague, there are 10 beach volleyball courses. It's a one, one million euro business. And uh, in 2018, I started to managing it. Till that was like a charity with zero profit. It was just working because my kids playing beach volleyball. I used to play beach volleyball. There were 500 kids playing beach volleyball makes sense. But in 2018, I was free. So I just started managing myself. And uh, finally, I was sold uh, two months ago for a million euro. And it was also a nice experience just to prepare for someone else who can uh, take care and, you know, be a fan of beach volleyball and can, can make profitable business on sport. So that was so my... What, 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 did you do to, what did you do to sort of turn it from a charity making no money into a business that you were able to sell for, you know, multi-millions of euros? What, 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 what were the changes you made? Oh, I, I, actually, uh, I built it from completely different business regarding the marketing, regarding you know the who's going to play there, uh, the pricing, uh, you know, for kids, uh, the, tr the transfer donation from from the government, whatever. So it was combination of of lots of things to make profitable, at, and it worked. It's it, it now it's it's doing hundred hundred fifty thousand euro per year, which is, which is not bad on sports centers, and I hope it will. 
that would take another 10, 20 years at least. I, I'm helping still the guys I sold because I'd like to be to working. My kid's still playing there. I, I, I'm playing there. So hopefully it's a, it's a good project for a long time. Okay, great. And I think you also went into the, uh, into the hospitality sector as well as another one of your projects. Yes, yes. In 2014, when I you know, tried to spend my money, I, actually I made one mistake. I, I put the money to Swiss Bank, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, some wealth, wealth bank she's taking after your wealth. And, and I lose money after three years, of course, which is usual. I found that I have to invest myself. So in 2014, I bought some apartments in the Czech mountains. It was a, it was quite, you know, unique, unique project uh, that time. When when you buy some apartment in a hotel, there is someone who is running the business, and and you are taking something like rent for your apartments, which are used by uh, by the guests or, or also by you if you need uh, when when you like to spend that time, that time. And finally, 2019, there was second building built. And in 2019, I just take over the running business. So I had some apartments, like owner of apartments, one of the 50 owners, because there were 71 apartments. And I take over the restaurants, take over the wellness, take over the you know conference hall and some other properties. And now I'm running two hotels, which is a great experience for me and completely different management. Because if you're leading your university-educated uh, people in Bunzel and then you're leading the, the cooks and the receptionist and, and, you know, mates, it's a different story. But it's, uh, it's a nice business. Uh, we managed to improve from, you know, discount company selling to four-star hotels with very good restaurants. One is TripAdvisor, Travel Choice. And a, and a very nice place, Czech mountains, close to the highest uh, mountain, Sněžka in Czech. And a very nice street, and amazing wellness. So it's it's just sexy business, and it's profitable. We're struggling uh, during the COVID, but now we are full, and uh, it, it worked. It's uh, there is very nice and very good team, forty employees, and yeah, it, it's another fan. And I learned a lot. I learned how to. You know, uh, wash the uh, towels, etc., <laughs> and cleaning the houses. And... Well, I was going to ask you that because you know it's it, it's it's always challenging. I think for an entrepreneur who's been successful in one sector, who then acquires a business in another sector, totally different from which they have no previous experience. Um, sometimes, you know, I've seen people really, you know, have problems with that, and and the business has not done well because. You know, they, they thought they were good at this sector, therefore they'll be good at anything. So, so how did you go about learning the hotel trade um, to make sure that this business was also successful and, and you, know, you didn't get just carried away with the success you'd had before? Uh, actually, you know, it, it's a little bit easier because I'm also the customer. I'm also the guest. So I, I'd like to know how, how it should be, you know. I, I'm a long time the, the Marriott owner of, you know, some weeks sharing in Marriott in Marbella, Lestepona, etc. So, so that was my benchmark. And I'd like to improve on that level. Probably wouldn't be on that level uh, anymore because it's a five star and we are four star. However, I'd like to have a good service, you know, very clean rooms, uh, perfect food, uh, you know, amazing receptionist all the time smiling. So I'm doing for myself as a guest. And I have to try everything. So I start to cleaning the room. I start to helping uh, in the restaurant, helping in the kitchen. So I, I, I just, you know, turn, I tried all the positions and then I knew what I need, you know, from my people. And it wasn't easy, you know, to, to build a team in, in hospitality in Czech is, is quite a hard, hard task. And uh, for example, we made very good decision uh, during the COVID because we didn't fire uh, any employee during the COVID and all, you know, hotels around us just fire the people and waiting till it, till it ends. And when it ends, they don't have a staff and we are full and still knocking on the door of someone else. They'd like to work for us. So, and, and that's about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm telling, uh, you know, every, it, it, it's trying, it, it's, it's quite interesting that, that no of the, no, lots of uh, directors of hospitality business 
uh, are not motivating the employee on sales. In, in our hotels, receptionists are on sales, direct sales, cooks are on sales, the sales of restaurant. Right? So, so the basic salary is about 30 to 50% max. The other is sales. And, and it's just work because they'd like to sell. Uh, Excellent. No, that's, that's, that's really powerful. I think that that's a real you know, transformational change. And also, as you say, hanging on to your staff during the pandemic was obviously now looking like a very clever move. I think uh, everyone from airlines to hotels went too far the other way in losing staff. And now they can't cope with demand coming back stronger than ever. So, you, you know, you're in a very a good position there as well. And I think it's also a bit of a family business because your, your, your wife helps with the, the marketing of the business, I believe. Yes, it's, it's a big help. It's a big help because we have, I think, suppose the best marketer in hospitality in Czech because my wife starting in Atomic, then working as a marketing director for BMW, important, and then working for a magazine L. Uh, actually, it was Hachette for the Bucky Company. There were eight or ten magazines. So she was working like a marketing director, one of the best marketer in Czech Republic, and she's now taking care about our hotels, which is a big help. So we have an amazing web, we have very good social medias, and yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a family business. That's great. And if you combine, obviously, your background in sales and business, building business development with, with her background in marketing, um, you know, it's quite a potent combination. So you know, are there any other kind of businesses or sectors that you're thinking you might like to get involved in? Oh, I'd like to more relax if I could. Uh, it's still taking me quite a lot of time, the hotels, and I completely forgot that it's funny story is this, the, the, my company uh, co-owner is a, is a Marek Lesho, he's, he's my neighbor and friend, and he, he used to work for banks, for the big banks, Deutsche Bank, etc. So we have also the best reporting in hospitals in Czech, I suppose. No, but uh, So it, it's a very good team, it's a very good team. But... Uh, the hotel is still taking me one, two days a week. I'm traveling there once or once a week or once in a fort, fortnight. And uh, I'm I'm now finding uh, you know conservative investment to real estate, and uh, not to spend too much time by uh, managing the people. Uh, actually, it's it's the most ex- exhausting uh, work you could do is managing and motivating the people. It's still harder and harder. I feel. Oh, absolutely. I know you're right there. So, so what about you know, your personal portfolio? Well, once you have the liquidity event, um, obviously you'll be looking around for things to invest in. So what sort of assets got your attention and, and what did you end up investing in after you had the, uh, the sale to Bunzel? Oh, I, as, as I mentioned, uh, I started with well management, uh, which seems to be conservative and, and safe. Finally, I found it's, uh, it's just nonsense. It's uh, you're just paying the fees. Uh, then, then, then I invest on some real estate. I, I also invest to you know um, two two projects. There was a office building founds where we where we're buying quite large offices in Prague, twenty thousand square meters and more. In the center of Prague, and then selling in a three years, which was perfect because there was double, double profit in two three years. But now it's now it's more difficult to find some project which is which which could be like that. And uh, at the moment, I'm focusing on real estate. So I invest uh, two houses in Portugal, and uh, I'm diversifying the portfolio, uh, Czech and, and other countries in the Europe. And I'm thinking maybe in some real estate in Panama. Uh, because of the Russian aggression, so it, it's good not to, you know, be uh, addicted to just one place, especially in Czech, which is quite close. But uh, I'm still, you know, heavily. Uh, we are still investing in in Petrosinsko in the mountains because the street is amazing street. It's the street to the highest mountain, which will never change, and uh, this will be once a very rich street uh, uh, in the Czech Republic. So we'd like to invest there also to real estate and development. Okay. And, and it's interesting you touched on a point there. You, I mean, you mentioned uh, Panama and obviously Portugal. You know, I mean, I, I've relocated here to Portugal from the UK, which is how, how we met. Um, but also, you know, part of, part of that is obviously lifestyle, part of it is tax regime, but also I think alternative um, residency, citizenship and so on. Um, and uh, are you thinking, is, is part of your thinking that you want 
multiple choices of where you could live uh, with, you know, obviously Portugal being one, but maybe even somewhere further afield being another. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's that's the definite option. You know, uh, probably all the, you know, all the time I was thinking that I will, uh, when I will be 60, I'm 45, so I'm still quite young to move forever. And, and, you know, Oliver is 12, my son, so he's attending gymnasium here, quite prestige one. So we don't want to move uh, till, you know, eight years. Uh, but uh, definitely I will move when I will be 55, 60, 65 uh, to warm place, a nice place with the sea and enjoy golf uh, a whole year. And it's, uh, yeah, it's it's a future and, and residence is, is one of the options, definitely. Yeah, and as, as we record this, you've just come back from watching the, the Open at St. Andrews. So uh, you're obviously getting a bit of golf in, both playing and watching. Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing because every year we're attending. It's a uh, it's a nice uh, it's a nice experience to watch uh, Tiger Woods uh, live. I know, indeed, yes, and uh, yeah, possibly his last appearance there. Um, now, what do you think of the? You know, we touched on inflation, but you know the whole general macroeconomic situation at the moment. You know, we've got rising interest rates, very high inflation. We've got We've got the whole kind of geopolitical risks of what's going on in, in Central Europe and Eastern Europe there. Um, is that impacting any of your own thinking or your decision making as, as you go forward? Uh, actually, you know, I'm an expert, but uh, I'm not an expert, but uh, I feel it's more uh, stagflation coming. And when stagflation comes, then everybody's losing. Uh, so that's why I'm more and more conservative uh, for investments, uh, mainly to uh, just the buildings, real estate. Uh, and uh, I feel cash might play a very big role, but to keeping the cash is losing. So it's going to be hard times for uh, probably most of us. And uh, there are more others difficulties with the employment. For example, in Czech, more than 26% employees are working for state. So there are no employees for private sector and private sector is paying less. So most of the people just don't want to work after the COVID. They get their home office. So, you know, labor effectivity, productivity is low. So it's very hard to start, uh, you know, some new business if you don't have a very good idea. And, and it's a big risk. Even the financing, 10% interest in check is the usual rate if you're borrowing from bank. So, yeah, it's, I think, uh, nice times were and hard times coming and it will take long, my opinion. Hopefully I'm, uh, I'm right. We'll see. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I agree with you. I think what we're seeing is rising prices, but, but no rise in productivity. Um, uh, you know, GDP flat or, or falling. So, yeah, it feels like, I mean, I'm old enough to remember the 1970s and it's starting to feel very much like that with a, an energy crisis as well thrown in. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be a very challenging time. Uh, I think just as you, know, you might want to add some gold to your portfolio, maybe my suggestion, have a bit of a gold bullion stacked away somewhere. Um, but uh, as we come to the end of our time together, Philip, um, Obviously, you've been through several uh, uh, businesses where you've grown them and sold them. Um, the people that are listening to us now are, are somewhere on that journey of either trying to grow their business or sell it. What would be the kind of two or three main pieces of advice that you would offer based on your own experience of how to grow a business and how to sell a business? Uh to grow. So I think, you know, when I see around uh, lots of entrepreneurs just earning first million check rounds, which is 40,000 euros and starting to spend, that's a big mistake. Uh, so definitely my advice would be to keep as much as you can, uh, do not spend, invest to grow, invest your company. It's going to be 10 times more at the end. So that will be my first advice. The The, the second is, is just good time management. I am a fan of four generation time management philosophy. Uh, which is about I'm not spending, uh, you know, I'm not using my head like the database. I'm using my head as an operation memory. So I have a very strict calendar, very strict task, and I'm, I'm, I'm strict in cliche, which is Pareto rules. So all the time I'm thinking if what I'm doing leading to some effect. 
and um, you know just cancelling lots of meetings and cancelling uh, lots of tasks, which is not leading to to the results because you know part of the rules is the cliche that saying eighty percent you are doing is leading to twenty percent results, and you can cut all the time. So very good time management is is good. And for example, in two thousand nine, I, I completely you know rebuilt my company in two thousand nine. We had a big trouble. Uh, I, I didn't swap uh, the four million US dollars buying the goods from the Far East and losing about a million euro. And uh, it was only first year and the last year where we were uh, in a loss nine million Czech kronen, which was about four hundred thousand euros. And I had to rebuild my company because I have a big loans. We were paying in advance, you know, keeping stock and then waiting ninety days for payments from the retail chains. So the banks just came and they would like to money back. I couldn't pay. I almost bankrupt. So after this experience in 2019, I just rebuilt my company regarding the performance tuning. So I take, uh, you know, just built a company from the zero and uh, fired 10, 15 people. And in the same year, I make a 10 percent more sales and 50 percent more profit. So you can all the time. Thinking about what's important, if it's necessary to have one hundred fifty-five, one thousand and five hundred customers, or if it's okay if you have two hundred customers, it's all the time the same like a parrot rules. You can have ten hundred customers, still no risk, and it's bringing you more profit with very good productivity. So th- that helped me a lot. I-, I don't know what's going to be tomorrow. I don't know what's going to be next week. I I, I don't want to know that. I just you know see my calendar in the evening and, and see if I will take a tie or if I can go in shorts to golf. And I'm happy uh, not know that and, you know, can use my brain on thinking what's what's a good idea to do. And then what I didn't do at the beginning, and I would definitely advise was just, you know, the, the big thing, uh, whatever you do, you could do in, in, a, in a, you know, bigger picture and you spend the same energy for different results. It's similar like a Pareto rules, but uh, you could do a business and you could do much bigger business, which just, uh, you know, spend the same energy for that. Never give up. Never give so, up. So, so, so think, think, think bigger, in other words. Don't, yes, don't, think don't, bigger. Uh, yeah. Don't be constrained. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, don't it's, be it's hard to... It's one of those, yeah, well, that's right. And it's, it's, it's as much work to win a, a million pound contract as it is to win a thousand pound contract often, isn't it? And, and you, you just have to start believing you can do it and believing it's out there to be done um, is, is 50% of the challenge, I think. So um, obviously you, you, you managed to achieve that in your time. So, well, thanks very much for, for sharing with us today, Philip. And uh, we'll let you get back to the golf course um, and uh, wish you every success in your, in your future ventures. Thanks very much indeed, Philip uh, Linick, for joining us today thank you if you'd like to suggest topics for future episodes appear as a guest on the show or invite me onto your podcast you can get me on graham at grahamrowan.com thanks for listening and i'll see you next time on grow my business or sell it